The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92 000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, welcome to the Engine Room podcast from Ensemble. I'm Andrew Rocks, and I'm going to spend the next little while with a great practice manager. The whole purpose of the engine room is to promote the business of the business and we're working through some of Australia's leading practices, both existing and also visionary, to find out what makes those practices tick. And I'm here today with Mitch Ransbotham and he's from Coastal Advice Group. Um, good morning, how are you? Very well, Roxy, thank you very much. Now, in your preamble, you told me that this is where my opportunity exists to either keep people or lose people on this podcast. So, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you, <laughs> if I am starting to lose you here, the best is yet to come, so stick with me. Yeah, so desperation is not really a usual selling <laughs> tactic that uh, we, 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 we endorse, but I like uh, I think that the term is authentic vulnerability and um, that you've heard it here. So, um, I suppose just to, to kick things off, and it's always good to to get a bit of a feel for, for the people. And I know that you've been on, a, on an ensemble podcast before. Um, just give us a bit of an idea more about how you've managed to get to the role of practice manager or general manager within your group, but how you got there on your journey, please. Sure. Um, so I started with Coastal two years ago. Uh, the role that I'm in at the moment of group general manager encompasses all of the, you know, the whole multiple, multiple disciplinary business that we run up and down the East Coast. Where I've come from. The so just to clarify, the east coast of where? East coast of Australia. Right. Uh, New South Wales. So my backstory is I have been in financial planning, financial services since I, since I was but a babe. This is where I landed following a, a stint at university that I, didn't, that I thought was going to be my bag, but really didn't end up being what I wanted to do. Um, as you find with most people, I fell into financial services, but I didn't just fall into financial services. I fell in love with financial services and I really, really enjoy what I do. I did a brief stint as an advisor. I then had an opportunity following success over there uh, to, to, to go with a manager at the time into product distribution land um, as an opportunity. He, he, you know, he asked me to come along with him, which I, which I grabbed the opportunity with open arms. And that's where I remained for the next 15 or so years. Wow. Um, from, you know, little baby, little baby BDM floundering away with next to no idea what he was doing, but a really positive attitude about it, um, all the way through to spending uh, the period prior to moving into this role um, as the strategic partnerships manager for AIA. So I looked after all of the national licensee relationships and platform relationships uh, for AIA. So you kind of had a bit of an advantage in that you, you've been assessing your potential long-term suitors um, from that particular perspective. And uh, when you said you, you, you fell in love with uh, financial planning, um, I almost threw in some sort of swipe gag, but um, I thought I'd leave that there because you've already pulled the desperation card much, much earlier. <laughs> leave me alone. So, so then you, 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 you 
getting a decent lens across all practices. Yes. Um, and where were you located? Uh, overall, I did a stint in, in Sydney. Um, I thought that during the formative years of my career, it'd be silly of me not to be able to do all of the extracurricular, meet the people, build the network uh, in the in the industry to make sure that... Very topical um, with people. Uh, you know, I, I speak to a lot of people who worry about their young people not working from home all the time and, and you've just sort of... I suppose inadvertently summarised why it's good to have a healthy mix of both. Absolutely. And I, I uh, head on heart, would say that that was um, a key to the success of that particular point in time because I really put myself out there. I was young and had a lot of time on my hands and didn't have kids like I do now and it was pretty easy to go out for Friday drinks and go to all of the industry events and go to everything that I was invited to or invited myself to invariably. Um, but, you know, that was a that was a core part of it. Um I then I now live on the central coast uh, and have done for a long time. That's where I that's where I grew up and where my formative years were. I found myself couch surfing most weekends and just spending bulk rent in Sydney and spending most of my weekends on the central coast anyway. So it made sense. Uh, but the flexibility of the role um, and the way that the BDM role worked for me just meant that if I was spending the right amount of time client facing, I didn't need to be in the office anyway. So if I was happy to do the hours and happy to do the case, it didn't matter where I positioned myself. And the coastal business um, wasn't a startup. It had been around for for some years. Mm. And was it a case of you went to them and presented uh, sort of a role and opportunity or were they actively looking at that stage? Oh, mate, they were hunting me. Come on. (laughs) Uh, So I'd known, I've known Daniel for 10 years of that, that, element of my career and 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 just as Daniel uh, just as I've watched Daniel go through the throes of his evolution um, I first visited him while he was an advisor with his uncle at Newcastle Financial Planning and uh, an, an older business in the junction uh, prior 10 years down the track um, we find ourselves at, at a point where I had been his BDM for a long time he'd seen what I had done and what I was focusing on doing in my career and trying to differentiate myself from your regular BDM that comes out, drops a brochure. This is a generalization. Sorry, BDMs. But, you know, the the the, the perspective would be um, there is some very, very good BDMs out there and a really, really good BDM does stand out because they are not just there to push their, to peddle their own wares peddle their own agenda. They have an acute awareness of the business, acute aware of, uh, awareness of um, the desires, the, the, the growth plans, the pain points, the frictions, all of the things that you can actually assist them to bring best practice into the business on a, on a completely selfless basis. I think, I think you're right. I think um, the best BDMs do actually have that consultative approach, which is why um, there's quite a few people um, who've made careers out of it, but they've changed um, providers. They've changed the label, but they still retain those relationships because of the value that they've added. Absolutely. Um, would be would be my thoughts, and um, yep. m- many names spring to mind. Um, so you've now, can I ask, um, and this is a great question to get out of the way, what do you refer to the title of your role? Because um, as part of this podcast, we're trying to sort of promote uh, practice manager, general management. What, what's what's your title? So my title is Group General Manager of the Coastal Advice Group. Um, group General Manager because it is not just um, a financial planning business. It is a multidisciplinary business, at the, and the hub and spoke model that we have built or that I've built since starting means that there is multiple dis- different aspects, brands, uh, and businesses that fall under that one umbrella. Well, maybe let's let's lift the lid on that. You know, so um, uh, you've got the coastal advice group, and um, you, you said that you you group, which is uh, means there's a few disciplines. Maybe give us a bit of an idea. I'd love to know about you know your organisational structure, your ARs, how you structure them, how you structure their support. The reason is, is if I was working for you, what would I expect? I suppose is the best way of answering this. So, so where where do you sit now? Okay, so that's a really big question to unpack. Really big question. So the people pieces... We did speak about it earlier. We did, I know, but you've sideswiped <laughs> side me now. Um, so at the moment, um, we're sitting at circa 50 staff. Um, we also have offshoring arrangements for both 
administrative services and uh, SOA production and delivery. The AR numbers at this particular point in time is at 11. Yeah. Um, so 11 of the 50 are, are, are authorised representatives. Authorised representatives, 10 of those being uh, wealth advisors with a with a, a flick of risk in there. We have one advisor that looks after all risk-only clients separate to that. Okay. And um, what do the rest? What, what, how do you organise the, 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 the support? You know, this is your jam. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the when I started... Um, the business is now the business now due to the size. Um, we got to a point where we've moved away from the the genesis of the business, which was Daniel with a couple of people. Everybody's doing a lot of stuff, doing it okay, but not really well. And everybody's got their their strengths and weaknesses, right? Yep. Uh, and to Daniel's credit, he is a serial entrepreneur. That's why you and him get along so well, Roxy. Uh, he he is very very good. Yeah, at blue sky thinking and uh, new concepts and growth and all of that sort of stuff. But you know, there's some vulnerabilities as well, um, and some um, and some of the things that he was lacking. He was really open to, realised, and then has started to build out a team around him, which is which absolutely to him is a credit to him being able to look inwardly and go, you know what? As much as I'm good at driving the growth of a business. I can find the opportunities, but I need somebody else to 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 put it all together for me. And so, what did that? How did that? How did that land? So, what? How are you organised now in order to be able to deliver? So, you've got your strategy. How how do you execute for these eleven ARs who who, who are lucky enough to find themselves at Coastal? Perfect. Um, we so so we've moved from the 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 generalist to one of our mantras in this business now is right people in the right roles. Um, the right people in the right roles means to us that we should have advisors, you know, 70 to 80% of the time spending their time with or in front of or speaking to or, or servicing our clients and ensuring that they're getting the value that they deserve for what they pay. So we've broken that out into two completely different channels, one of which I lead, which is the advice channel, which encompasses all of the advisors, advisor support, um, and the marketing side of the business. Yep. Then we've got an engine room and an oper- like an operations arm of the business, yep. which is headed by um, my counterpart and, and a fantastic resource uh, and a very, very good employee in our business um, and also a partner in the business, Nicole Mundy, who absolutely on this cred- uh, on this podcast, I will give credit to. Oh, Nicole. Um, Nicole was my first choice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't available today. Sorry. Um so we now have two really defined uh, arms of the business with um, management and an accountability chart that goes both ways um, as to what roles, outcomes, and specific big rocks yep. um, people have to, to work on on a 60, 90, 180, 360 sort of basis. And tell me, like you just said, you've an ambitious target of of having your 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 ARs or your, your financial planner spending seventy percent of their time with clients. And you know, if I did a straw poll for every financial planner, that that's sort of bordering on fantasy. So, is that one of your your sort of big rocks, or or, or and how and how how do you how do, how did you convince them to let go when you were doing the change management? Because as you said, the business has evolved, and many practices out there really want to be able to do that statement, but you know, their advisor wants to do a little bit of power planning. The power planner wants to still maybe do a bit of admin. How, how, how did you do that change management? It's still happening. And and it's one of those things that come with human nature, right? Even throughout my career, there's certain things that you find it hard to let go of because there's just a certain way that you like them delivered. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we've really become conscious of though is that I think you, you call it. Uh, do you call it highest and best use? I think is your your term for it. Yeah. Yeah. But the right people doing the right things at the right times also just another awesome way of saying it. I like to call it highest positive purpose. So I like people to be working towards their highest positive purpose and where they can add value. One of the things that it's I like, like goals based team membership correct. rather than goals based advice. Correct. Yeah. What I, and what I like to reinforce is on on one side what you know if if. The culture in the culture of our business, I really feel as though we have a one big happy family. 
and I think that if you canvassed any of the people downstairs from where we are today, they'd probably agree. One of the things that I think people struggle to remember is that if you are not working to your highest positive purpose, you're probably actually hurting the person that you're sitting next to. You are taking away their opportunity to shine in what is their highest positive purpose. If you're holding on to work that you shouldn't be doing, that they would thrive at doing and stand out, you're actually hamstringing them from really shining. Maybe give us a couple of like real world examples, in, say in a practice. Well, what would be things that, you're, that you've, you've taken off people or or yeah, what tasks as an example? So we, we're really fortunate in this business that we have incredible people and we've designed it in a certain way so that there is a, a really cascading effect to the different arms of the business, which has a couple of uh, which which has a couple of benefits, I suppose. One of which is a really clear career trajectory for anybody working within the business, but also a, a very um, a specific skill set of the person sitting next to you. So, an example would be an advisor, much like a accounting practice or a legal practice. In our big, hairy, audacious goal of 70 to 80% client-facing time. Our expectation is that we book a specific amount of time for a, an advisor meeting, which should encompass enough, enough time for them simply to do the file note, goals, strategy, and scoping for the plan, and walk out and simply be able to have somebody that is trained, educated, and skilled enough sitting, I won't say behind, but next to them, yeah. to just pick that up and run with it. And it's then their opportunity to really wow via turnaround times, data, client outcomes, feedback. It's for them then to take hold of that and really wow the business and the clients with the outcomes that they deliver rather than the advisor holding onto it and not following that highest and best use. And do you, um, so the first the first thing is that um, clearly you didn't walk out of a meeting um, during COVID and give it to someone else. So, so in relation to running a team that um you know is is potentially and i will ask a question around hybrid work and you're sure you've got just to clarify a few other ones um how many offices do you have we've got four at present yeah, and geographically how far apart are they from each other significantly this is australia after all it's not it does it so we've got uh we do have a a serviced office in sydney so we could call it five but our predominantly our practices are erin are on the central coast newcastle port macquarie and Byron Bay, Ballina. Right. So there's a, yeah, there's a fair drive. So, so you, you must trust in your, your systems and technology and, and, and maybe as a, as a headline, um, uh, but what type of advice, I mean, what type of advice do you typically give? Um, what's your avatar? That's a good and very broad question again. So that's another benefit of a business with scale, uh, is that I have an advisor demographic from late twenties to late sixties male, female, with all sorts of dis different specialties. So for me, there's lots of disparate avatars available within the business for me to be able to say, and I know that it sounds it sounds a bit cheap, but I, 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 we can literally take all comers. Um, it, it's not that one advisor will do it, but irrespective of the advice specifics or the strategy to be employed, I have somebody that specializes in some way, shape, or form, and I and the beauty of that is that it allows the person to inwardly look, discover what that avatar is, and that that can be their thing. You don't have to fit into a specific mould to be an advisor for the Coastal Advice Group. If you've got a specialty, a desire, and it makes sense, go ahead, spread your wings, and I'll try to I'll try to enable it for you. And just to clarify, or your advisors, it is an employed model. Are they employees of the overall group, or are they um, are, are they've got their own sub businesses? What what's the structure of how, how they're engaged with you guys? At present, um, we have five shareholders. Yep. So there is a mix of shareholder employee yep. and and straight employee. Okay, so but they're all employees. Okay, yep. because I do know that um, uh, from memory you have you, you guys have acquired and absorbed businesses and, mm. and whatnot. And in order to be able to um, have that level of ARs and 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 do the you know all the re requirements for reviews and whatnot. You mentioned that um, how how do you like nail your advice process? Maybe I'll just get, start with um uh, your licensee or your self licensed. Uh, we're licensed. Yeah, we're licensed via RI Advice under yep. Insignia. Okay, and how long has that been? 
Okay. A long time since right. the since the inception of the the coastal advice business. Okay. Um, way back when that was. Um, we've been with them for a long time, and um, to be honest, we have a really really strong uh, institutional commercial partnership with the RI advice guys, and 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 we don't see the need. You know, there's a lot of talk in the marketplace about self licensing and you know positives pitfalls. We're in a a really strong partnership with. Um, the insignia guys and and has been fantastic. That, well, there, there you go. There you go. I hope they're listening. So, uh, <laughs> um, I, I, even maybe your desperate plea at the beginning has kept them this long. So, Mitch. <laughs> um, and then and and how how do you uh, generate the the advice? I mean, what's the process? Uh, um, is it all? I mean, is it digital advice? Um, do you you've got you said you've got like some outsourcing paper plan? You've got um in have you got an Australian based power planning team as well? Uh, we don't. So we run we run in our, in our business so we're really big proponents of trying to find the best of the best and we've worked really heavily um over the last couple of years to try to go out and absorb all of the best practice that there is in the marketplace from the most weird and wonderful places that we possibly could um it's a it's a an investment uh, and and it, and it costs but we've come back with some unbelievable takeaways the way that we structure it is um, we run a diamond. So diamond teams were a big buzzword a little while ago where you've got a lead advisor at the top and you, you've then got two associate advisors or, or advisors under them and, and a support person. Okay. Yep. Um, we run uh, in this business what's called a house structure. It's, so it's, keep it's, talking. It's I thought you were going to get a run of cubic zirconia, but um, no, no. our structure uh, is still good. Same, same, but different. Right, so it has a, a lead advisor at the top. So our, our our predominant goal would be to have every advisor, uh, every house running in excess of one point five million dollars worth of uh, annual recurring revenue. Yep, with a lead advisor at the top, mm -hmm. working with clients on a segmented basis. So they're more of your high net worth. Yep, um, and then supporting and doing, you know, some of that finding, originating, and conversion work. So you'd have a real mix of a lead advisor at the top that is multidisciplinary, quite experienced, and has a bit of responsibility. They play a, a branch manager or team leader type role, supported by two advisors underneath who they help to originate and convert leads uh, with two support people underneath them with a, a bit of a, a career trajectory through it. So one one of the support per people are generally doing a, a more of a CSA type role the other would then be stepping, taking the next step into a more strategic advice delivery, um, pa oh, pseudo para planning role, yep, um, or strategy role without actually having to do the minutia of developing the document. And you mentioned um, you do a bit of marketing, and and um, you know for many years marketing wasn't really something that financial planners did because they were just struggling to get through the the, the, the change that hap that's happened regulatory. Mm. Um, does your marketing do so coastal itself? generates a lot of the, the the inquiries or is it reliant on those partners? Because it sounds like if you're managing one and a half million dollars worth of revenue and you're retaining that, it we it's pretty hard to go out and have a bunch of spare time. So what does what does Coastal do to assist with bringing in those clients? Um, so the there's some really strict metrics that we run to. We've got a fantastic business coach um, by the name of David Hines, who you may have met. David has had some real success in his career. You know, anybody that doesn't know David, chuck it into Google, have a look. Uh, they say that success is often a path well-traveled, and he's one of those blokes that has most certainly traveled that path. So um, we've developed out some uh, some dashboarding and some metrics that the business really strictly adheres to and and really allows us to make considered decisions around capacity and resource management and making sure that we do still have the ability to grow. So I've got at any stage the ability to lob some some numbers out of our data lake that you would call a data pond uh, and <laughs> and chuck them into our chuck them into our metrics and we're able to work out exactly where we are from a capacity point of view at any particular point in time so that we can make some considered, uh, HR and, res uh, and resourcing type decisions, and we have the ability to plan forward based on our current run rate for any capacity that we'll need. And at present, to be honest, um, it's it, 
the, the, the need is absolutely there. So w- we will be putting people on, I would suggest, over the next little while, both from a merger and acquisition point of view, but also from an organic growth perspective. So just to clarify on that, if I'm, a, if I'm a, an advisor, but I don't come with an existing client base, you guys would be open to that because you've got sufficient current and future demand. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's a different type of advisor that can come along and do that. It's a very, very, it's a very, very confident, very, how do I put this in a PC way? A very confident- Please try. <laughs> it, it takes a really different advisor as an employee to confidently build and convert leads to an extent that allows it to be commercially viable. Um, but if you've got if you've got that ability and yep. acumen to get in and really convert, absolutely. We've got an advisor doing it now. So I've got an advisor right now who's just come out of his professional year who at this at this point in time is eight from eight since the star uh, eight from eight or seven from eight um, since the start of the year and he's absolutely on fire meeting all of our minimum meeting all of our minimums all, all of them are going on to ongoings and he's an absolute gun but he's a bit of a unicorn but ab- absolutely the the opportunity is there and I, I suppose I just um, changed tack because we spoke um we've, we've spoken about your licensee they're one of your your stakeholders in your success and. And it's always good to give a positive a shout out. Mm-hmm. Um, another um, key part of people's success is is the tech stack that they're operating. So, what's what's the tech stack look like at Coastal? Not just for financial planning, but the overall group. There's a couple of parts to that. Um, we, due to the size now, are working a lot heavier on what we need to do from a tech point of view. It's not going to be tenable for us to continue running the way that we are. And what's what's your incumbent? What does that look like? Ah, oh, it looks like multiple disparate yeah. spreadsheets and data points yeah. being pulled from all diff- all sorts of different places, which is cool. And you've got the, the standard RI advice generation, Iris stuff. And that's the only one yeah. that's the only one hamstring I would suggest is just when you are with a, a licensee like that, you are simply you get their iteration of X plan. You're you're open to or or or, or closed up by what they, what data they are prepared to share and not, and how they're looking to to, to, to synergize with any of the other uh, third parties out there. But the flip side is you don't have to pay for it all to be done. Correct. Self license, you you have that, but potentially you're paying. It comes at a price. Absolutely, and we do get fantastic. You know, uh, we've got some great guys in in RI that if we do need anything, they will do their utmost to get the information to us. But it does start to become um, a, a little time intensive. But to their credit, um, we're working with a couple of tech providers at the moment. Um, we've got we've got a any names. Uh, we're we're looking at Zeppo at present. Paul Campbell. We're, we're talking to Zeppo. I run three different scoreboards out of this business. Um, one for the for the team, another from a management perspective, and then I put together a, a balanced scorecard, which is the individual advisor KPIs and metrics for the year. So is that a built or off the shelf piece of technology? Built, I built it myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm looking, you know, the the amount of time that it takes me to pull all of that data together out of our data lake is just monumental, yeah. and getting bigger and bigger considering the 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 growth of the business. So we're looking to have to automate that sooner rather than later, and we're 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 in the midst of that as we speak. Awesome. And then um, the other thing is just getting a a, a bit of a feel for. Um, you mentioned you've got some employee shareholders. Yep. Um, and in a second, I'm going to get you to tell us about your people and culture, things like, you know, is there ESOPs, is there, you know, because these days talent is your, your, your greatest resource and your greatest cost. Yep. Okay. Um, and, and running, running your people really well and making sure they hit their goals is a, is a fundamental pillar of being a best practice. You can't get to a large number of people who are retained unless you're doing something right. Yes. Um, so I'd be... I'd be very interested to hear you, you've got your you've got you've got your shareholders you've got these these people you've got them from different areas. I'd like to hear how you bring people in when so that how do you culturally assimilate someone if you've gone and bought a practice? Um, maybe at the end we'll see if you're in the market for buying new ones if anyone's um you know out there or whatnot. Um, so what makes I'll, I'll reframe this. So let's say that I wanted to work for Coastal. What makes you guys special? What makes you different? And 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 try and be relatively clear on this, yeah. You know, like because what we're hoping to achieve with this series is getting 
the best and most appropriate talent to work their way to the best and most appropriate practices. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, what makes you special? That's a good question. Can I add something to the last one first? I've taken note of your whole question. I just want, I want to add as part of the tech stack, something that I think is really, really important. Go for it. Um, we've got a, a part of the tech stack. Uh, it's available through Insignia, but it's replicated elsewhere. Um, it's called Wealth Central that we use. Um, the others, the likes of Lumiant, uh, which is the great and powerful Santi Burridge. Um, there's My Prosperity, all those sorts of different iterations out there. What we have found from a uh, an efficiency and a client engagement point of view, um, value is moving away from talking about re- uh, you know two A four pages worth of returns and putting them in front of a client when they walk into a meeting. Gone are the days when you derive your value from individual line items and what they're returning. Um, the cash flow modeling, the central communication hub, the security, the goals and aspirations, the values-based conversations that can come out of software like that, we have found huge in this business. So I just I, I wanted to touch on that because I thought it w- I, I, I thought it would be you know left unsaid. No, well, the, the, a core tenet of uh, of you, what we do. You know that Wealth Central is close to my heart. I, I used it um, in my practice. Yep. Uh, I worked with Tim, the founder, um, and and. Yeah, I was passionate about that. Clients only perceive the value they see. So they're not overly concerned that you've had to spend 24 minutes on hold to Centrelink or, or on hold to one of the product providers. Um, what they care about is what they see. And, and I think that, um, uh, you know, when you mentioned quite a few variations there, and I think it's a, a vital part of, of not just obtaining but retaining clients. And also making them making your team feel really happy about what they're delivering. So yeah, no thanks for that. And um, and 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 but the other part of people and culture is if you give your team the best tools, they're going to be happier to start with. Yeah. But um, over to you. What highest and best use? That's it. Um. So look, as far as why would why would you work at Coastal Advice? Um. We're at a point now where I think when you get to the size and scale that we are, with the really defined roles. Um, you know, we've we've got things like um, the way the just some of the philosophies that we've got a, remun- a, a clearly written, documented remuneration philosophy, remuneration philosophy, which outlines where a per, you know based on your job grade and your role and your experience where she, where you should expect to be and what you should expect to be paid so into the future. So you're giving them a career path when they start. Absolutely. Okay. So we've got, we've got that documented out. So where you would start at a baseline, and where would you where you would expect to be, and what the remuneration would be at that point, what your what the key um, the key achieve the chief achievables or or core competencies at that point would be, yeah. uh, and then what your trajectory looks like, both from a aspirational career point of view, but also from a remuneration point of view. Um, so we're we're really really uh, transparent as far as what that looks like, not just from the pure dollars aspect because you and I both know that it's not just about dollars it's about wanting to turn up at the same time um and, and how do you find having um how, how do you find those regional markets are you are you so are you sourcing most of your team from the local area in those 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 um towns that you mentioned or or, or, or not or what what's your experience yeah we are we are actually that I, I I think that there's um based on some of the movements in the market recently, with banks getting out and some of the larger instos making some of the moves that they are, there's some really good talent around and available if people know that you're around and know that you're available and you hold yourself out there as a as a decent place to work. Yeah. Um, and I think that some of the things that we have and, and some of the, the visibility that we have based on our, uh, our footprint and what we do with social media and advertising and sponsorship uh, and community events and community work and that sort of stuff hold us in that sort of esteem and, and, and reflects the culture and persona of the business to be a bit of a draw card. Let me give a couple of examples of, of, of those points. Right. So so from a not just a, an employee onboarding, but from a client onboarding point of view as well, um, we would regularly get a, a, a resume through the door from somebody hearing, looking, aware of us and what we do, having come across us previously. Um, we are on a couple of buses up in Newcastle. We sponsored the Knights last year. We sponsored the local body boarding club. 
Um, we just sponsored the Hunter Melanoma Research Institute and and attended their 35th birthday fundraising uh, charity fundraising event. We really put ourselves out there. Locations like this tend to be quite parochial, right? Right. We 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 focus on the regional areas outside of capital cities, and you as you, you know, you would know you're a you're from Tamworth, right? I wish I was from Tamworth, but Tam- Tamworth was the place that we went to on holidays. But I get what yeah. it's um we're out there, you know you're, you're, west west western New South West. That's right, right. So I'm the same. I'm a I'm a country boy, born and bred. I I grew up in my younger younger years in Tenerfield. So I'm I'm a I'm a small town, and you didn't uh, become a saddler despite the the song. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you find that the Central Coast, Newcastle, Port Macquarie. They are all still big country towns and uber parochial. And if you are seen to be, which we are, and we happily do, to be supporting the local community, you end up in you end up in the in the in the spotlight, right? So, so a couple of things from that. I mean, the same conversation could be had uh, in 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 regional Queensland towns or down south at Absolutely. WA. You know, uh, Victoria's got really big parochial towns all through there, and is the decisions around. Uh, sponsorship and, and just support is that uh, is that a collaborative uh, exercise? You know, if I'm an, an advisor, is there forums where I can sort of say oh, I'm interested in that? How does that work? You know, what's what's your policy for for having that sort of feedback in the business? Absolutely, we had a marketing budget uh, the year before last, and we put it to the vote. Uh, f- for example, the best example that we've got is that we sponsored the Central Coast Mariners. And that was a joint collaborative decision via open forum. We have a marketing budget to spend. What's the highest and best use of these marketing dollars? Would you like to be able to, on a on a family to family, you know, person to person basis, like to be able to take your clients out, rub shoulders with them, you know, build a relationship, show some value, um, but also be able to show some value in the community and what we're doing in supporting some of the some of the things that they do. And that was that was made by the team. That was put that 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 was was ratified by the whole team. And I'm really interested in how people, you know, there's a whole adage of higher, slow, and fire fast. We're not here today to talk about firing, mm. but we. But I'm really interested in, in in different people's approach to hiring, mm. regardless of the role. Mm. What, what's the approach? How do you guys? What's your process? And um, you know, do you use psychometric testing? Do you not? Do you do panel interviews? Just give me a bit of an idea of what you guys do, not just to bring people in, but also to defend the existing culture. Yep. Right, because you're only as strong as your weakest link. Agree. So, so well, what's 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 the what's the coastal process? So we've had um, that's a, that's a real learning. That we've had over the last little while, it's me specifically, um, I've come from a position where I have managed some people, most of those chosen for me um, previously, and not somebody that I'd hired. So that's been a real learning for me and a real growth over the last couple of years. I won't say a couple of mistakes were made, um, but hope you do because that's the truth. Because it's not a it's not a mistake; it's a learning, yeah. right? Um, you never make any mistakes; they're just opportunities to learn. And I learnt and I learnt from them. Um, what have you refined it to now? We have gone from, you know, it's it's all about your your viewpoint of it too. Um, when you look, when you believe that things are scarce uh, and that you need a solution, and if you don't take the solution that's right in front of you, you're just going to miss the opportunity. Um, you change your mindset to one um, of abundance, and that there's people out there, and that you've done all of the work on your brand and your business that you are yep. in a position where you can command the, uh, the type of people that you want. Um, it fundamentally changes the way that things work out too. <laughs> um, so we now put them through. We have previously used some recruitment um, directly. Uh, we use uh, centers of influence and and some of the relationships that we've got around to to, um, to find opportunities as well. Um, otherwise, it's recruitment or ads out on seek and those types of things, and uh, they go through a. To interview, then disc prover profiling. Okay. Um, because we have the ability now, based on um, the type of personality, to put them, you know, to, to really shuffle the deck chairs around a little bit and 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 make a home for somebody if they're the right culture fit, which is the most important part. If they're a right culture fit, but they have a certain skill set that we need to move things around to make that work, we're absolutely able to do it. So as long as 
they meet the pub rules of they turn up, they do good work, and they're a pretty decent person. Um, we're going to be okay to be able to manipulate the system in some way, shape, or form to make sure that the right people get into the right spots and are supported the right way to do their highest and best. And look, I, I'm a big fan of using the, the, the psychometric testing mm. um, because the last thing you want to do is set people up in an environment where they fail because that's kind of not just their fault, it's yours as well. Set, know, set a farmer up with for, as a hunter. That's it. Yeah. Or, or, or something along those lines. Yeah. And, um, the other aspect is, like, how do you onboard someone? So say, for instance, um, this is about practice management, but getting the people right is important. Yes. So you've got to find the right people. You've given me an idea that that they know how to find you. You've got a bit of, you've given me an, another idea of how you filter them, but then how do they start? Because she's that first three days, 30 days, 60 nights, they're very important. Mm-hmm. What, how would you onboard regardless of the person? Is there anything specific? Do you have a, a culture kind of onboarding component to it? What, what's, um, I mean, I know today we're doing a session and the rest of your team, the reason it's so quiet in your office is they're doing boxing. Yep. So um, uh, I'm not sure if that's Dan's performance appraisal. I haven't actually dug deep into the type of boxing. It may be, but... I, may, I may miss out on a bonus <laughs> or, or, or a pay increase this year because I didn't go. <laughs> but, 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 but back to onboarding, you know, yep. how does it look and what, how, do they, how do they, what's a structured approach to bringing them into your culture? Okay. Um, I don't think. My personal viewpoint is culture is something that you do every day. It's not something that you roll out, right? So my opinion is that we, when, and another thing that we've really had to develop is the onboarding process that we go through. And we felt right now I, I can fall on my sword and say happily to any of my employees that are listening now that probably came in a year ago, I'm sorry. For what that looked for what that looked like, we did not have a written, detailed um, procedure processes and procedures manual. We had a lot of key person risk and a lot of stakeholder risk, um, whereas we now have a written procedures manual. Um, we didn't have a line by line project plan onboarding type project plan with uh, day one getting everything set up, what your week two looks like with shadowing advisors, learning about the investment philosophy how we use the systems, shadowing the operations team to make sure that they understand exactly how the rhythms of routines of and routines of our fixed price um, fixed price agreements work and the dates that they need to use and what goes where and the tasks and all of the things that go into the minutia of what needs to happen behind the scenes. You get the right person on and you go, yeah, you're a great advisor. Strategically, you can give solid advice. That's not enough. Because the business works in such a way that there's a lot behind. Once you scratch the surface, there's a lot that goes on in a financial planning practice. A lot of it enabled by technology. A lot of that technology may not have been used by this individual before because they're coming from a different business, licensee, operating model, whatever it might be. You need to make sure that rather than throwing people in the deep end, you give them the best opportunity for success. And I can hand on heart say that we didn't do that at the start, but again, it wasn't a failure. It was a learning and we learned from it and we did very quickly because you get that feedback. Um, So we've put together a really rigorous documented now onboarding, uh, onboarding process when people come on over about a month period to really get them into the rhythms, routines, and cadence of what we do, and they've got a Bible to refer to at any stage if they're stuck, but they've still got, you know, 50 people around them that you're going to be able to find the answer somewhere as well. Thanks, thanks. And then um, just just looping back um, when you were talking about the type of business, uh, are you a multidiscipline practice? Do you do other things outside of financial planning? Well, what's, what's, what are the other offerings that your business has and how do you run the delivery and the people in those those offerings we we saw a risk and an opportunity i think it, it's been spoken about ad nauseum um that the the opportunity of a multiple you know a hub and spoke type multidisciplinary practice um is huge not just for the opportunity for different channels and different types of revenue into the business but also to ensure that your clients aren't having to go elsewhere to seek the services and potentially be referred to somebody else. We 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 love our clients. Um, we do goals and value based advice. 
And to be able to handle all of that inquiry, to be able to knock all of that on its head within the coastal advice group of, of companies um, was, that was a huge driver of mine. And how do you do it? How we do it is we have the financial planning business. Uh, within Coastal Advice Group, we have a specialist life insurance arm, a fantastic um, lifelong insurance advisor in our business who gives specific insurance only advice. So your, your financial planner, when they got when they get to the specialist insurance advice, would then, you know, they're almost the I mean, I'm the general practitioner, and they go to the specialist to come in to give that, uh, and they you both deliver that to the client. Absolutely, okay, just like a GP, right? If you needed open heart surgery, you wouldn't go to the GP. If you need a mole removed, you can though, right? Yeah. Same same premise. Yeah. If if the wealth advisor has a bit of life insurance, a bit of TPD and something fairly standard that they need to write, they can and are empowered to. Yeah. But when it get, starts to get a bit technical, we have that expertise. We have that ability. Um, we also then run um, a mortgage and lending business yep. powered by, powered by, and power is the, the operative word. Uh, powered by Lydian, um, Roxy, where the partnership that we have with with Lydian and and, and your business on that side, I, I'm not going to do the proverbial, but we have a, a very we have an outstanding professional partnership with Lydian. Uh, lending, especially in today's world, is a core deliverable for a financial planning practice around any type of you know bucket strategy, cash flow strategy. The, the whole the, the whole ecosystem of somebody's world at the moment is being flipped on its head by the way that the world's working. So for us to be able to handle that in-house, internalize the conversation, walk away and and have all of that delivered and 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 be and the ability to control the narrative and the outcome to a certain extent was of huge importance to us as well. Awesome, awesome. And do you what about um, when it comes to one of the other pillars, the the accounting and legal. How do you how do you handle that? So legal, we have um, multiple geographically based uh, vetted partnerships and centres of influence. Yep. Um, the same with accounting, accounting with an asterisk behind it because we have internalised the self managed super fund admin accounting and audit functions via another third party ar- arrangement. And who is that? If you don't want to be uh, there's there's a, a business on the central coast, um, a connection of mine that I used to work with named Matt. He he owned the accounting arm of the first financial planning practice that I ever worked with. There you go, relationships. Um, yeah, and and we we are working together now to 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 build out this whole okay. uh, program within the business. Anybody that would like um, to entertain something like this. Um, Roxy will be able to pass on my details. I'm sure that they'll be somewhere where you can find me on LinkedIn. I would happily do a, a warm introduction to Matt and his team um, to ensure that you can stand up the same thing in your practice if it's something that you'd like to do. So it's, it's like it's like it's like um, um, sort of getting a consultant in, but it's, it's still retained. You'd retain the asset value. You'd bring in the smarts and the execution. Is that right? Yeah, and and again, we work in parallel with each other. Yeah. So I am aware and confident and comfortable with the service that's delivered, how it's done, the timely way that it's performed, what the client should expect to see, what they will provide us, what we will provide them, and it is just seamless. And it is done at a cost that is about 30, 20 to 30% down from what they can expect to see in market. There you go. So that And, and is this the sort of business, Coastal, where majority of the clients come through the financial planning and then cascade out or... Or do they start in other divisions or or do you get a lot of accounting leads? Give me an idea of like, is it, I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but is it a, it's a financial planning first cash flow? Is that, is that exactly the process? We're now a business that provides financial planning. We're not a financial planning business. We're a business yep. that provides financial planning, lending, and the SMSF services that we do. Because of our core competency and, and what the business has been doing for such a long time, yes, I agree. That at right now, in the absence of our ability to have really worked on the marketing side of things um, for Coastal Super Admin and for Coastal Mortgage Group, they're not really uh, a revenue generator. They're they're, 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 they're a servicing arm at the moment. However, I really foresee some growth in that area over the next little while as we put our foot down. It is just another ability to differentiate yourself. And from a marketing point of view, the 
the SEO opportunities, the authority opportunities online that you get from being able to present those types of services, absolutely they can be a feeder to to the the company as a whole. And look, I'll give you a shout out as well. Um, I know that I hear feedback from um, our, our Lydian business that um, the, the clients that come through, particularly our strategic relationship with H&R Block, uh, um, are really well serviced from that overall perspective mm. within your group. So. Uh, big thanks to you on that because it's a it's a big job and and um, we were looking for a for a good partner. Pleasure. Now, um, thank you for giving us an overview of where you're at. A bit of a feeling for uh, the fact that it's a very much a local business. You've outlined the sponsorship. I would like to ask for your vision for the future for a couple of fa- aspects. The first one is a vision and and this the vision for your the future of the industry, mm-hmm. the future of coastal, and where you see the role of general manager or COO being positioned in the practices of the future? So industry, coastal, and where you see that. Okay. So the industry, uh, wait and see. QAR, I was very, very happy, as I'm sure you were, to see some of the suggestions that came out of that. Uh, we'll just see how that goes now. And, and we won't talk too much about that because if this podcast no, comes out after this <laughs> after this is handed down, we don't want to be caught with our pants up, down, or sideways. Correct. So, and that's why I thought I'd, I'd leave it there. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go into any conjecture there. But I think what we're starting to see in the way that our business runs and the way that the the industry is going, um, I think the industry is probably moving towards exactly what I was just talking about. Um, there is a lot more businesses now starting to move into a position where they are rather than a financial planner trying to run a business and not having a lot of time to spend uh, on the business, just being in the business and yep. having to keep the wheels turning over, um, we're getting into a more corporatized model. I believe we're getting into a more corporatized model or seeing success in a corporatized model where there is a business. Shouldn't be shocked by that. I mean, this is uh, the birth of financial planning really happened with the advent of compulsory superannuation in 92, but accounting firms, you know, we've always looked at it. So they've, they've got mid-tier firms and yeah. I, I think that, it's not going to be for everyone, and maybe it, it mightn't be perfect in in some of the small regionals. But but the organisational structure very much so. I'm I'm in agreement, mate. Uh, there's uh, and and you know we, we, you talk about a cottage industry. We're now really the, the professionalism that has been thrust upon us. Training wheels are off. Yep, training wheels are off. I am all for different strokes for different folks. There's going to be lifestyle businesses out there, and it is not the wrong thing to do if you are the type of advisor that thrives on a lifestyle business where you've got 500, 600, 700,000 worth of revenue, very happy clients that are very close friends as well. You've got a couple of core people in your business. The competencies are all there. You're keeping the lights on. Everybody's happy. I absolutely hand on heart say congratulations to you and keep doing that if that's what makes you happy. On the other hand, there is pressures or headwinds coming to a certain extent that means that in a lot of circumstances, there's going to be a limit to that where businesses are going to be hit with more and more cost, potentially, you know, we left QAR behind, let's just pretend that's not there. More and more, there has been an overlay of increasing costs and complexity to running a business that means that, you know, some of your margins are squeezed and it makes it a lot harder. And clients want, clients want it. An experience in their professionals, which is at the equivalent of the experience they just got. So when I go home, I can choose any television stream. I can flick between. I can get what I want when I want it. And as a as as a professional service provider, we have to be as good as their other experiences, or they're just not going to want to buy what we've got. And they'll just turn you off like that's they do exactly, everybody else. That's exactly instant right. gratification. They can do that now. You just turn it off. That's right. So so that's and and so what about the vision for the the so you were getting to the point that that the the small practices um, and lifestyle practices have everything, but arguably, if I'm coming to work in coastal and I'm at Byron Bay, mm-hmm. I, I can't see more of a lifestyle destination on this 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 country than Byron Bay. It, couldn't I effectively run a business within a business and have that, but with all of the support? Isn't that what you're intimating? Yahtzee, you've hit the nail on the head, and that is our strat- That's our ongoing strategy at the moment. One of our largest focuses are. We are looking for, so I'm happy to be open and honest about it. We're looking at a, we're looking for a 15% plus organic growth rate from our existing businesses year on year. And we are also looking for strategic uh, acquisition and merger opportunities up and down the East Coast of Australia as well. So from, from when you say the East Coast? From Sydney to the Gold Coast. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, 
Okay, well, that's 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 awesome. And um, when was the? How many of those have you done in the last couple of years, or since you, in your tenure? Seven. Seven. Okay. Yeah. So for those listening, these guys, um, like they practiced on their employees years ago, they've just practiced on their previous acquisition. So increasingly, they're getting it more and more right and more and more refined. So yeah, yeah. And again, we, we I, I, I don't, I wouldn't think we've always been pretty good at that. Um, a lot of the initial things that I built out when I came across to the business were to support that because it's a really different dynamic. Um, once you've got a core group of people that come across that are used to having been self-employed, having a level of control, making their own decisions, we were, we were always really confident that it was a fundamental shift away from doing that um, to being an employee. So there's a, you know, there's a, mix, there's a mixture of things that we do around how we onboard the clients, uh, oh, no, sorry, how we onboard the, the advisors and, and what the deal structure looks like, whether that's a, a full buyout, whether there's a seat at the table or, or, or you know, there's the, the opportunities there are endless, but we, there had to be an ability for them to fold into the business and not to see a wholesale change in the way that they do things. So the structure around empowering them to still have a seat at the table from a shareholder perspective but then also to still have a leadership and mentoring position to still be able to make the forum, to have the forums to make collaborative decisions around how the business is run and all of those sorts of things. We empower that so that you don't, you know, one of the hardest things for a business owner to do coming across is to let go of control. And and does that, I mean, on the ground, does that look like, do you do, you do, um, like conferences or getaways yep. or, you know, uh, over and above the licensee ones? 100%. Yep. We, we, so we did, Two last year, we did an all CAG, uh, a whole business conference last year. Uh, we took everybody down to the quarantine station in Sydney. So not just the advisors, the whole, just the advisors, whole team. Um, we took the advisors then to an offsite up at Byron. Um, we took a cohort away to the licensee conference. Two weeks ago, it, from a cultural point of view, um, we do Founders Day. And Founders Day is uh, the day that Coastal Advice was started um, we roll it out every year, and every does Dan yeah. give an Abraham Lincoln speech? No, we do. We do awards though. <laughs> um, so we get everybody together, family, friends, the whole lot. Yep. Um, from the receptionist to the CEO, everybody comes and brings their family along, including kids. Um, we hosted the whole day, hired out a local um, surf life saving club. We did awards and call, called out all of our special people in front of their special f- people yep. for all of the really special things that they did, which was amazing. So it brings that, that last comment brings me to um, you know a, a really fun part of what I'm looking to introduce here is just to give some shout outs. Yep. Okay. So um, uh, we've already spoken about, you've given, you know, is there any any one or any team you'd like to give a shout out to. And then, then, then we sort of like want to round out with a bit of an idea of uh, people have had a, 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 a good listen to your business. Mm. They can look up the links. Mm. If any of this has resonated, you know exactly what you're looking for. We can, we can, we can sort of bring that one home with a with some win. But first of all, have you got any, any shout outs to, to people that have helped you from a business perspective, from inside Coastal? I think you mentioned coaching before. Go for it. Yeah, so um, I'm a firm believer that your coach is not just your manager, that coaches are everywhere. Your yep. coach is your wife, your coach is your kids, your coach is your co- coaches are all around you. You just have to be able to see them for what they are. So um, ultimately, I'd like to, you know, I've thanked all the, all the guys at uh, Insignia from Darren Werrett, Pete Ormsby and all the guys in the PDM team. Um, our outsourcing partners, VBP, Advice Lab, coaches, David Hines, but coaches for me, thanks to all of the fantastic businesses that I had the opportunity to go out and see during my tenure as a BDM and in distribution, because you guys ultimately, irrespective of what your business makeup was at the time, um, selfishly, I, I was able to take some of the unbelievable things that you guys were doing, irrespective of how big or small that they might have been, and uh, integrate and execute into some of the things that I'm doing at the moment. Um, we've got partners like you know Liddy and and, and this the self-managed super fund team that we've got but also the internal team at coastal our manager at you know the manager Dan Brown the CEO here absolute visionary Nicole Mundy who I mentioned before 
We have our marketing team. You asked me why would somebody come and work at Coastal? I have a marketing team that last month organically gathered 60 plus opportunities from Google and SEO work alone and booked 47 of those because they were deemed to be an ideal client fit for our business. And who is that up? Stacey Jones. She is an absolute magician. So, you know, why would you why would you join Coastal? Because we not only from an employee point of view, we support you with growth where you would like to be and the opportunities within the business because of the scale and the and the way that the makeup of the business now in general and as we continue to grow, as you could imagine and as you've seen, Roxy, those opportunities just become endless. And the, 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 the things that people can skew into and some of the specialties that you can start to tease out, the goals and aspirations of the pit, just like you do as a financial planner, you start to learn more of the goals and aspirations of your employees because ultimately they're my clients. And I get to then- Very interesting. They're your clients. It's, that's- that's you because you do have a duty of care. That's the, the wonderful thing about being a, a GM or a That's GM. why I yeah. love what I do. Oh, that's why I come from financial planning. I love what I do because I still have the ability to make a real difference. It's just to a different client set now. Um, so I, I'm really excited. Um, some of the, the integrations that we're doing with merger and acquisition and the way that we're doing that with best practice um, and, and really honed our skill and ability there to make sure that all of the things that we're doing are fit for purpose Everybody feels happy, love, like they've got fair value. They've still got a seat at the table and we're a one big happy family. And uh, all of the opportunities then from all of the organic stuff that we're doing, the opportunity abounds for any advisor that we take on. And look, I think I can do your call to action for you. For those of you at home who are playing um, the word family bingo, that's the ninth time that is referred <laughs> to family. So I suppose if, if you were wondering uh, the type of environment um, and the type of team it is. It is a family focus. There's the that the, they're always talking about bringing the, the 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 kids, the family. So so if if that resonates with you, then then they're the type of group that that really embrace that. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's fair to say across the locations. What were your locations again? Central Coast. Yep. Newcastle. Yep. Port Macquarie. Yep. Byron Bay, Ballard, Byron Bay. So um, if you're aspirational, you're local, you want to stay local, not have to to um, head to the big city to get that big career break. I'd be well worth reaching out to these guys. If you, if, if, if family is important to you either now or aspirationally in the future, that sounds that there. And are you still in the market for acquisitions? Absolutely. So the call to, as an extension to that call to action, anybody out there that they believe that their highest and best purpose is providing fantastic financial outcomes for as many Australians as we possibly can, tired of running a business, tired of compliance pressures, tired of risk, tired of playing HR, finance and everything all together, we now have a business to support you, which will allow you to continue to, you know, to do that highest and best purpose to receive your fair value for all of the hard yards that you've put in during the time, but continue to have a seat at the table, continue to have control and continue to grow along with us. And look, I don't think I could sum it up any better than that. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank um, the Coastal Group. And yep, uh, the Engine Room podcast is, as we said, about matching up the right and best quality talent in this country with the most appropriate and best quality practice. I'd like to thank you for your time. Mate, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity and thank you all for listening.